At the moment, we're doing lots of work around science and social media. We're doing digital communication strategies. We're running social media workshops. Um, we run an on-site Twitter chat, which happens monthly. And so we're interested in how scientists and science institutions are using social media to talk with a range of communities um, around science and around what they do. And so we wanted to interview scientists about how they were using social media tools and techniques in more sophisticated ways. The uh, professional science communicators sometimes worry that they're being pushed out by scientists mediating themselves. That now there's blogging and, and Twitter, the scientists can just do, them, do it themselves. And professionals look at it and go, well, I do it a lot better. And um, equally, the scientists um, go, well, I haven't got time for this. That's why we have professionals and uh, I don't know how to do it. And there's questions about how you can connect um, professionals to be facilitators and supporters of scientists blogging, for example, themselves. I think conversation is an interesting project like that. Um, well, I think that's sometimes something we miss sometimes with communication. Uh, we think that it's all about um, an informed um, person or an informed body of people talking to an un uninformed body of people, whereas when you begin to talk about engagement, you've got sophistication if it works effectively on both sides. Maybe the, the absolute knowledge and understanding may be different, but sophistication with how you actually deal with, with knowledge is going to be the same, so it's an equal partnership. Again, a lovely example we had in the early days was a zone, a general zone, where we had a wide variety of scientists, and we had one scientist who was studying, looking for a cure to a particular type of cancer, another scientist who was a road traffic psychologist. And it was just fascinating to see in the live chats how... Um, Initially, the students were going, well, you know, you're going to cure cancer. Let's give you the 500 pounds. You know, that, that's brilliant. Um, and then to hear other voices come and saying, well, that particular type of cancer doesn't kill that many people. But how many young people get killed on the roads each year? And so in the end, they were coming around to that. What may not seem like so important road traffic psychology, a yawn, actually had a massive direct relevance to, to these young people. And so being able to see um, you know, how different disciplines of science um, affect in different ways and, and seeing the debate unfold, it, it was fascinating to us as science communicators. I would say it's two things. I mean, it's definitely about finding a new audience or finding a bigger audience because up until that point, what I've been doing was really um, doing local art shows, which you're going to hit, a, you know, a, a pretty small audience no matter how you slice it, you know, of people who physically have to be there. And I still, you know, deeply believe that my work is better in person. <laughs> Um, I still love it when people come to see it, but, you know, I, I understand the shortcomings of that. It's, you know, you, you're going to just reach a tremendously larger number of people when you can put your work online. Um, but the other thing has really been uh, to get away from the sort of people who are interested in art and moving into the people who are more interested in science because... Um, I think that it just, they really appreciate having something that's artistic but that reflects what they're doing. Um, you can develop those communities in public so other people can see you doing that, which I think can help build trust. So I spend a lot of time on Twitter just eavesdropping. And I think a lot of other people do too. I think one of the reasons why I like Twitter is um, because it allows me to see conversations and I'm a sociologist with a occasional anthropological leanings and just like watching people because I'm nosy um, uh, but I think I can see particularly my science communication students can learn a lot from watching science writers talk to each other um, it's conversations and bonding between people, professional community people in professional communities which would happen in um, conferences or um, in the pub afterwards and not everyone has access to that um, just because, you know, we don't live in the same city or you don't get invited to the pub because you don't invite everyone. But if you can see bits of it... I do get excited where somebody who I think is influential 
becomes engaged with what I'm saying. Um, so, for instance, the, the former science minister um, in the UK, um, he was very active on, on Twitter and we had one or two um, interactions. That, to me, both surprised me, but made me feel that this is worthwhile because this is not trivial. I'm actually having a conversation with somebody who can and is making a difference. <laughs> I'm just a person who sits in my dining room and paints. Um, and yet I can connect, you know, through these various social media with somebody like, you know, National Geographic, for example, which is a really large, well-established, you know, almost, you can say, historical kind of, um, you know, bastion of the mainstream media. So um, you, you're kind of not doing yourself any favors if you don't participate in this, because, you know, the, the kind of the sky's the limit. Quite often it's people who are, I mean, sometimes it's people who, you know, heroes, I guess. I'm never really somebody for heroes, but, you know, somebody who I think is amazing and why would they ever talk to me? But it's also, it can be a bit more informal, so particularly on things like Twitter. People who you've got a lot in common with professionally, um, who it's useful to know about, and if you worked in the same office or something, it would be great that you got to work alongside them, but there's nothing specific that you've got a reason to contact them for. So if they work in another country or even another side of town and you just don't have the same friends, so you never interact, you just don't really kind of get that informal knowing what they're up to, what they're thinking. And if you're just, you know, putting the odd tweet out every now and again saying, I think this, I'm reading this, I'm going here, you get a sense of who they are and you can build a bit of trust and a bit of relationship so that you can have that kind of more, it sort of broadens the, the scope of who could be your colleague in a way, I think. We have a look at how teenagers and, and young people are using social media because that's where I see the sophistication. That's where I, I see them treating it as just another way of them connecting with, with somebody else in a very sophisticated way. So uh, an example of that, um, look at my, my daughter's YouTube channel, Fellowship of the Ning, where there are six people spread around the world who are having a conversation, not in real time, but, but over extended time um, through YouTube. This is not just them broadcasting their, their lives over YouTube, it's them actually developing relationships and developing a community and doing that in a very sophisticated way in terms of what they say, how they say it, how they respond, how they don't respond. So what you're really seeing is a really deep, complex set of relationships that are spread out for everybody to see. Uh, that to me is sophistication. And, and I think you see the same hap happening with other communities and other media. I run a, a regular kind of debating, it's like a cross between a seminar and a tweet up for people who are interested in um, online science in London. They can get together, have a drink and talk about an interesting topic. And uh, we've had ones on women in science blogging and science and hobbies and all sorts of different things. And we're going to do one on the sounds of science. And what I want to, we've got some podcasters coming along and some radio makers and a musician. And um, they'll just present a little bit about what they do. And then I hope that a lot of the people in the audience will be either listeners to podcasts or quite a few can probably make them themselves and we'll talk about it and we'll have interesting conversations. One of the things I want to do in the run up to that is get. Do you know Audio Boo? It's like Flickr for sound, so people can just share small sound files. There's a really neat uh, iPhone app that just allows you to quickly find a clip. On So if you're walking down the street and you hear a weird noise, you can just record it and then upload it and share it and tag it, like you might with an, with an image. And people don't, don't use it quite as much as they do Flickr. I don't think we share sounds. There isn't a culture of sharing sounds in a way that there's a long culture of sharing photos or pictures. Uh, but it's a really nice... It's growing and, and, and really nice website. And some people do use it loads. And I think it would be lovely to get scientists to uh, audio boo sounds in their labs and think about the sounds of science. I think there's a real potential for that. But I think there's a danger also in the, you know, go to where it's happening and have your discussions there. Um, and there is a tension um, when you organize this type of thing be between saying let's have everything on our site because you know we can brand it and we can put the funders logo on it and sort of letting it flourish wherever it flourishes but the danger I think is is with um, with the go to where the conversations are happening and th this is some of our work outside I'm a scientist driving this is that the quickest place to find people and to share um, information perhaps might be something like Facebook. 
and Facebook is wonderful. The, the speed at which you get people to start seeing your content on there is wonderful. But I just question the value of, um, of, of having a conversation on Facebook where you do have such little control and the, the discussion tools are really quite blunt. Um, so I'm not trying to say ignore Facebook as a as a part of your online engagement, but you might want to think of it much more as a marketing tool as opposed to the place for all the discussion. But that would be a controversial view. It goes back to the good days and the bad days. The the, the bad days are the days when I I just. I, speaking personally, I don't think, feel, feel I am being successful. I write a blog and nobody reads it. I put stuff on Twitter and nobody retweets it. Um, so I, I don't entirely know. that The only measure that I have, and it's a very, very qualitative measure, is if I get a response from a single person that indicates they read something that I, I put up and it resonated with them, it meant something to them, enough for them to actually get back to me and start a conversation, I feel that it was being worthwhile. Um, and I my, I guess my sort of bar is, is very low, but I, I do feel that, that even if I sort of have that connection with one person, um, you're, you're actually developing something which is gonna, it, it's gonna um, change the conversation. Actually about it. I think if I was um, trying to measure impact as a research funder or a large institution, if I was working, Backing work there, back working in um, a science communication institution, I would want more than that. And I think that if I have to fill in an impact statement, uh, you know, reflecting on the impact of my research through social media or anything else as, an, as a professional, I would want more than just saying oh, I had an interesting conversation. It's 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 nice to say that, and that's why I do it as a hobby. But if it's part of my job and I'm something that I'm asking people to fund. Which it isn't. I mean, I see my blog entirely as a hobby. Um, I think we might demand a bit more than that. Um, and I think that's very hard to capture. And I think like with any of these kind of um, evaluation things, you need to invest quite a lot of money in really good social research to get a feel for it. There's one more aspect which I think is very interesting, which is the measurability of it all. Um, particularly when you compare this as a form of engagement against say, going to a conference, an exhibition, um, or just into a school, um, the ability to know just how well or how much engagement you are managing to do with your audience, um, which I think for people who are funding um, science engagement projects is incredibly useful. Um, and also for those taking part, they, they come away with the ability to know just how much they have done and, and for the scientists it's an absolutely incredible amount um, I saw one scientist recently he did count that he had written something like 40,000 words in the two weeks of the event with the blogging and with with Twitter I, I used to take the approach that I'll try and get at least one blog out a week and I'll try and spend a, a few minutes each day on Twitter um, just putting stuff up and, and, and interacting that worked fine when um, I only had about 60 or 80 hours a week worth of work to do. Uh, as, as the work sort of mounted up, I found it harder and harder. Um, and I haven't come up with a, a good solution. What, one thing I have found is that it's more of a discipline thing. So if I, I actually say, I'm going to do this, um, even if I've got an awful lot of work on my plate, it's possible to actually carve out that time just to start interacting with people. If I people often say to me, oh, you must be really busy. I keep seeing you doing this. You're running around everywhere because they can see where I am by the fact that I posted about it on Twitter. <laughs> Most of my colleagues are that busy running around. Most of them haven't got time to tweet about it. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, or equally the opposite thing is people, why do you have time to tweet? You should be working on time. Well, that's because I turn, turn my phone on for five minutes every few hours, which is a perfectly normal thing to do. It's my equivalent of looking out the window. Um, you, you take it around with you as you go and it becomes part of, part of your work.